System, Man and Cybernetics, SNC Society Chapter of IEEE Delhi Section, Communication Society of IEEE Delhi Section, Consultants Network Affinity, CNA Group of IEEE Delhi Section, Life Member Affinity, LMA Group of IEEE Delhi Section, Inter-Society Relations, IRS Standing Committee of IEEE Delhi Section, Industry Relations and Special Interest Group on Humanitarian Technology, Site Standing Committees of IEEE Delhi Section, with the Associations of Computer Society of India, Institute of Information Technology Professionals, IITP, ISTE Delhi Section and IETE Delhi Center as technical collaborators. Welcome you all to today's webinar on Computing Sciences Historical Perspective. It is also a moment of pride and honor to announce that we with united hands mark special contribution for the monumental occasion Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav, an initiative to celebrate 75 years of glorious independence by organizing the thought-provoking sessions for our better future. This webinar is also an initiative for celebration of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav. According to Kylie Rector, an author, I learned that computer science is not just about syntax and coding. We can make a difference in people's lives by developing application. Yes, this saying lays the foundation of today's webinar as it showcases the importance of these computing sciences in our current daily lives. Though the terms computing and computer sciences are not new, yet their idea and practice have a long history in India, China, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Greece, extending to at least 2,500 years. Greek logic and formalization tradition and Indian tradition of algorithmic problem solving form two of the four pillars of the current computer and information ICT revolution. Algorithmic problem solving has been one of the foundations of mathematics and logic, a part of philosophy, forms the basis of Euclidean geometry. The webinar today aims to discuss the various contributions of ancient and medieval Indian linguistics, ancient and medieval Indian computational mathematics, ancient and medieval Indian logic, intellectual environment and institutions in ancient and medieval India. So the webinar aims to discuss the all round perspective of all these issues. Before beginning with today's webinar, I would first take this opportunity to welcome amongst us our distinguished panelists for the today. We are privileged to have amongst us a galaxy of experts. So I would first welcome amongst us Professor M. N. Huda, sir, Director, Bharti Vidya Peets Institute of Computer Applications and Management, and Vice Press Chairperson, IEEE Delhi Section. I would first request, sir, to address the participants with his welcome address. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible, Dr. Ithika? Yes, sir. So, good evening. Everyone at the outset, let me first welcome my valued speaker, my elder friend, a fatherly figure to the teaching fraternity researchers in the domain of particularly the computer science and mathematical sciences in general, Professor Manohar Lalji. Thank you. It is all because of his passion that his, he always says yes, and that too for a topic for which every one of us need to prepare. And when I ask him, he readily agrees to prepare a topic and then deliver a talk, despite all his engagements and related multidimensional uh, involvements. So thank you so much, uh, Manor Lal sir, for having agreed to enlighten us. In fact, uh, the topic like computing uh, sciences, historical perspective in the right from uh, different uh, demography and different geography could not have been delivered better than you. So thank you so much. I also pay my gratitude to my friends from various professional societies, 
Of course, uh, Professor Subramaniam Kishmurti is here. My friend, Mr. Daman is here, who is always a source of strength for many things, not only this webinar, but many things and always ready. I do not know that uh, where from he gets this much time, but uh, he's always for these kind of events. So thank you so much, Mr. Daman and Professor Subraman, uh, Subramaniam Kishmurti, sir. I pay my deep sense of gratitude and my thanks to all part of uh, uh, all the audience who join uh, this webinar week after week from various parts of the country and abroad and keep on waiting for this webinar. If I missed in the morning to send the link to the various networks on WhatsApp group, uh, I am uh, fascinated to receive multiple requests, sir. Today's link I have not received so far. That's the kind of the weight which so dedicated and passionately uh, attending participants are having for this webinar. Dear, my dear friends, as you all of us are aware, that this webinar series is an initiative of IEEE, IET, BVI CAM uh, 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 joint platform as a weekly evening webinar series. And this is 93rd of that webinar which we have started. This implies seventh. In fact, six more to go and seventh will be the sanitary edition of this particular webinar. So I take a special um, opportunity, a special privilege to welcome you all for this webinar. Dear friends, when in May 2020, uh, COVID has uh, made us to realize that uh, probably there is nothing beyond this and all of us were locked inside our home. At that moment, IEEE people uh, realized that there is a need to engage people in constructive and learning kind of activities. And this webinar was outcome of that and we started that. With one or two exceptions in between, almost every Saturday evening, 6 to 7.30, I have requested you to block your calendar and you do it so passionately. So I'm thankful to all of you. Coming back to this uh, today's topic, Topic is so interesting. I said to you that uh, uh, ordinary people can't deliver this lecture. This lecture can be delivered <laughs> by the people who have seen seven to eight decades in the uh, in the uh, uh, front of their eyes, and they only can do justice with this topic: computing science and historical perspective. And Dr. Ritika as was telling that its roots are the way it is deeply rooted in China, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, and many other parts of the countries, but none other than the India itself. India itself has been the originator of these kind of concepts. That, so that is the beauty of this particular <clears throat> concept. I may not be in a position to do any justice on this topic, but just to sensitize you that how and in which way computer science has touched upon each one of us and to which extent it is going to touch in future and how if we if we uh, users or we uh, students of computer science we learners understand that computer science is an invention of last 50 years or computer science has changed our life uh, our life in last uh, 20 25 years probably we are mistaken it that's how this lecture is today's lecture is important to make us to realize that it's a uh, it is deeply rooted in our day to day civilization process in one or other way we have been using problem solving and in a big possible manner and that's how i always as a student of computer science as a learner of computer science has always say that computer science is the process process of solving complex problems and the problems could be personal problems could be professional problems could be industrial problems could, could be as a whole organizational and while, while solving problem, how to ensure that the technology is going to be used for the purpose of giving solution and while giving solutions, how to find alternative solutions, various alternative solutions, and then the technology is connected and embedded within the computer science helps us to understand that which one is an optimized solution, which one, which solution will uh, utilize the least possible resources. And that's the beauty of the computer science that every day it tries to improvise its own solution. And that's how it is said that the reason of such important application of computer science is that computers and technology have been integrated in our day-to-day -day life 
in a um, very uh, pervasive manner and not only not only the technical side rather the economical side manufacturing side industrial sides and a modern economy cannot be uh, ca cannot uh, remain in isolation without computer science that's the kind of the beauty of this subject that's the kind of the beauty of this technology computer science is evaluated and challenged by humans almost every day every new day you encounter a gazette every new day you encounter a kind of the alternative which gives you altogether a different perspective to solve the problem and that is the beauty of the computer science and that's how it is said that this technology has changed so fast that if you see the history of the civilizations no other civilizations in the world have changed so fast the way computer science has changed no other civilizations in the world has deeply got penetrated in our day to day life the way computer science has got penetrated and that's how it is important to understand that whether we are a student we are a learner of computer science or not but we in one other way certainly a user of a computer science and that's how i always say that from engineers to doctors a students to teachers entrepreneurs to investors government organizations to private players so much so the housewife working in a kitchen to a people designing a smart cities the lawyers preparing court cases for the for its best possible presentation to almost a kind of doctors working on the most complex and unidentified disease. That's the kind of the length and breadth of the penetration of the technology. There are many such applications already available. And this uh, latest uh, application of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning has got so much of pervasiveness in our day to day life that we cannot ignore its presence, even if we are not uh, the uh, students or the learners of computer science. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the field of computer science is projected to grow by 21 percent uh, by the year 2028, making it one of the fastest growing profession in the modern global economy. That's the kind of that's the kind of the, the magnitude with which the computer science is going to touch each one of us. And that's how I always say, ये दो पंक्तियाँ हमेशा मैं कहता हूँ जब कंप्यूटर साइंस के लोगों की बात आती है, शायद 30 साल पहले अगर हम में से किसी ने कहा होता कि दिस स्मॉल मोबाइल फोन विल विल हैव दिस मच ऑफ पावर व्हिच पॉसिबली 50 इयर्स अगो द फर्स्ट सुपर कंप्यूटर व्हिच वाज देयर लव वाज नॉट हैविंग दैट स्मॉल मोबाइल फोन विल हैव दैट काइंड ऑफ पावर एंड व्हाट एवर यू से बाय बट आई स्टिल एडमायर दैट द स्लोगन व्हिच धीरू भाई अंबानी हैज गिवन आफ्टर लॉन्चिंग द रिलायंस द फर्स्ट रिलायंस फोन दैट कर लो दुनिया मुट्ठी में नाउ यू कैन टॉक टू एनीवन एनीवेयर ऑन दिस प्लेनेट राइट ऑन द प्लेनेट are we are looking forward to that day that the way we are in a position to talk to anyone on this earth planet in the same way can we talk to anyone if there are lives on mars jupiter and other kind of planets and that's how the uh, internet is going to be the interplanetary internet that is the kind of the technology which is going to the shape shape and that's how uh, these two do pankhiyan jo maine bahut pehle likhi thi takriban 7 8 saal ho gaye wo hamesha technological perspective ke liye main sunata hu ke oh technology टेक्नोलॉजी के मुसाफिर तुम्हें अभी बहुत दूर जाना है ओ टेक्नोलॉजी के मुसाफिर तुम्हें अभी बहुत दूर जाना है पत्थरों पे गुलाब खिलाना है और आंधियों में चिराग जलाना है ये कंप्यूटर साइंस करते आई है और करती रहेगी लेकिन इससे पहले कि हम आगे जाएं आइए थोड़ा पीछे चलते हैं और अपने मनोहर लाल सर को इनवाइट करके ये समझते हैं कि हमारी कंप्यूटर साइंस की टेक्नोलॉजी हिस्टोरिकल पर्सपेक्टिव है क्या हमने प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग ऑप्टिमाइजेशन को कहा से कब से शुरुआत की और आज लोग कहते हैं नो स्क्वेल नो प्रोग्रामिंग मांगो डीबी एंड एक्सेट्रा एक्सेट्रा स्टिल द वैल्यू ऑफ एलगोरथिम solving the problem and finding the steps to solve the problem is how important in our life particularly while understanding this so thank you so much my dear friends all of you know that bharatiya vidyapit along with i i tripoli keeps on organizing multiple events multiple activities for all of you dr ritika has already briefed you that latest 4th october is the i tripoli foundation day it is going to be celebrated all across the world it is one such day on to which the technology people never ever forget and this year itropoli computer society uh, has decided to organize itropoli day celebrations 
at Bharatiya Vidyapeetan Institute of Computer Applications and Management on 7th and 8th of October. Massive level of events are being planned. Stay connected to our website. There will be few links being shared in the chat window and uh, keep participating wherever you are. Those teachers who are attending, my special request to all those teachers, please encourage your participate encourage your students to participate and also request you to become members of IEEE. We have got social obligation to get connected with the peer professionals and bring so many things for the benefit for the upgradation of the knowledge level of the peer professional. That's our main mandate. So thank you so much. Wish you all the best. God bless you all. And with this note, that so Pulo Kitara फिर खिलेंगे हम ये सस्टेनेबिलिटी के लिए भी है और ये हर अगले सैटरडे सस्टेनेबल तरीके से हम वेबिनार में मिले इसके लिए भी है कि फूलों की तरह फिर खिलेंगे हम और अगले सैटरडे एक नए टॉपिक के साथ फिर मिलेंगे हम अमिताभ बच्चन ने करोड़पति में कहा था ना अगले एपिसोड में फिर मिलेंगे हम तो अगले सैटरडे एक नए टॉपिक के साथ फिर मिलेंगे हम थैंक यू सो मच ऑल द बेस्ट एंड ओवर टू यू डॉक्टर कृतिका थैंक यू सो I will now welcome amongst us our expert speaker, Professor Manohar Lal sir, former director, Sources IGNU, New Delhi, with an e book. Thank you, Thank you. Professor Manohar Lal sir has teaching and research experience of more than 48 years, having taught at various universities, including University of Delhi, JNU, and South. Asian University. He has served as the director, School of Computer and Information Sciences, Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi. He has also been the professor and head of Computer Science Department and director, Computer Center at MD University, Rota, and at HP University, Shimla. A product of IIT Kanpur, IIT Delhi, and University of Delhi, he completed his MTech in computer science and engineering from IIT Kanpur and pursued his second PhD in computer science and engineering from IIT Delhi. Earlier, he completed his master's and PhD program in mathematics from University of Delhi. During 1982-83, he visited the North Carolina State University for postdoctoral work. He has delivered over 600 hours of lectures through educational channels <coughs> including EduSat and Gyan Darshan of TV and Gyan Vani of radio. Professor Lal also has a long research experience. Earlier, he worked in the area of error correcting codes, a branch of data communication. Currently, he's working in the areas of theoretical computer sciences, formal methods in software engineering and automation of reasoning. He is also a member of number of national and international academic and professional bodies. He is reviewer for a number of national and international journals in mathematics, artificial intelligence, and e-learning. So we are honored to have you amongst us, sir, today. We feel honored to address another intellect speaker for today's evening, Mr. Damandev Sut, sir, who is um, amongst us. With over 37 years in the industry and 18 years in the resilient domains, Sir is a certified international and corporate trainer with over 10,000 hours of training and teaching experience. Uh, sir has a wide professional journey with corporates like TCS, Zansa, and has played various executive and senior roles um, mm -hmm. during his uh, corporate tenure. He has also work, uh, is currently working with EY as Program Director Operational Resilience. He has traveled, worked in over 20 countries and has been a speaker and author of three books. The fourth is already underway. Sir has also served clients in various industrial sectors, including government, IT, uh, banking, financial services, etc and won multiple national and global awards, including ILA Global Outstanding Leadership Award 2021, BCI's Business Continuity Manager of the Year Award India 2009, BCI Merit Global Award 2012, BCI Continuity and Resilience Contributor Award, um, Middle East 2020 DRI's Lifetime Membership Award, and many more. Not only this, this great visionary has also spent 
con considerable efforts on uh, other works also. He is mentoring with IEEE, MentorCard, GameWise, etc., and is the chair of Computer Society chapter, chair of the Standing Committee IEEE Delhi section, and an IEEE ambassador. I again welcome you, sir, to today's session. I I would now well uh, request Manohar Lal, sir, to kindly enlighten the house. <clears throat> Thank you, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Basin, Dr. Ford, Professor Hoda, other panelists uh, for remembering me and giving me this opportunity of talking to or communicating with the larger audience across the world. I am also very much thankful to the various organizations which are involved in this one. Before I go ahead with the topic, let me share it with you so that we can start. Yeah. So friends, before I go ahead with the, actually doctor, this uh, thing is uh, appearing. Uh, can I make it, uh, there is something, uh, Uttam Singh, the uh, some okay, thank you. Before I go into the history of computing sciences, I say a few words about the history of this topic, computing sciences historical perspective. In view of the Azadika Amrit Mahatsav, Professor Hoda and I discussed the possible topic. And I propose computing sciences in ancient India. However, as always, earlier also has happened, he definitely proposed something which was is much better, computing sciences historical perspective. I'll elaborate that this is much wider and all that. But after delivering without violating the title, computing sciences historical perspective, I found that even computing sciences alternate history will also fit it and even computing and psychology may also fit it. So friends, in this respect, what I want to say, why alternate history? Alternate history in the sense, as Professor Hoda just now told, lot of new technologies are emerging, lot of applications are emerging almost every day. We are surprised, we could not imagine even 20 years back that the small, this mobile phone, will be incorporating all the all possible facilities which a computer could have had, even the largest possible computer or fastest possible computers. So what I mean to say, we know all these facts. However, behind these marvelous technological innovations, there's something much more fundamental and all that. And those issues are not taught generally, at least for the computing community. I feel it is very important to know about the foundations also. So this topic has been prepared in view of emphasizing the foundational issues in computer science, the roots of which go at least up to 1 million years back, as I'll explain. And it continues fervently. Its development is going very fervently even today. So in the light of these comments, Friends, I go to the next, oh, sorry, please, uh, just one minute. Uh, something is happening. So as I just, something is happening, a very big picture, uh, Uttam Singh, it can, oh, okay. A very big uh, picture of me and uh, 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 Ritika ji and everybody is, uh, which is uh, hiding my slides. Can you help me uh, in shortening this one? I don't know. Uh, this is too big. To co it covers almost my whole slide. Oh, thank you. So friends, uh, one thing about uh, this talk or my talking of style is that I have written down most of the things which I wish to convey. It is mainly in view. Again, they, these are not moving. I am uh, today. I am having a difficulty. Slides. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry for these hiccups. 
Well, <coughs> what I want to say that the development of computing started about 1 million back when human beings started speech. I'll elaborate about this one. And it is going on at a very fervent speed today also. So I have I was saying that I have written down in view of the fact that first of all, we don't have eye to eye contact with the art participants. Secondly, this is a big organization in which people from across the world participate. And the problem of pronunciation and accent sometimes arises. In order to be understandable, I have written down almost everything. Little explanation will be required. So in the light of these introductory comments, I start that first of all, because the topic spans at least 1 million years, and it is continuing developing at a very fast rate. Discussing all issues is very difficult. However, the technological issues, as I mentioned, and Professor Hota also mentioned, are almost not. So human beings started acquiring rudimentary computing skills around one to two million years ago, when they were separated from the other primates like monkeys and apes. And thoughts started being communicated through speech and elaborate. On the other hand, now every day computer related developments are taking place at unimaginable furious speed for discussing history of such an activity spanning millions of years is quite difficult. Hence, history of computing since the time of Babbage's proposing analytical engine around 1837 is somewhat known to almost everyone from computing community. Also more known are recent developments of and due to internet and worldwide web. Evolutionizing communication and publication beyond any wild imagination of people of my age including digital media devices and video games. However, there are many fundamental issues, though not all that glorious. This uh, slide is okay, as video games yet have played pivotal role in current revolution, which are generally less emphasized and less known. And in view of this fact, we will cover mainly these fundamental issues on Again, this problem, I think, today. Okay. So, friends, the topics which I'll cover. First of all, conceptual clarification. What is the difference between history and historical perspective? Because historical perspective occurs in the title. In different terms, computing, computer science, informatics, etc. And computing and intellectual activity of ancient origin, I elaborate on this. In the process, we'll discuss alphabetization and symbolization. Computing's inherited characteristics, as I told in the previous talk also, that computer computing has four parents, mathematics, logic, linguistics, and electronics. So naturally, it, is, it has inherited the characteristics of mathematics, linguistics, and logic. We'll briefly discuss those. Then mathematics, as I told you, is the main, actually one of the definition of computing is, it is executable mathematics with efficiency consideration. So it is a very special part of mathematics. Under this, we'll discuss algorithmic development, paradoxes, formalization, which is intellectual computing activity, mostly of that. Then I'll discuss linguistics and computing. Then I'll discuss formal and computing. Then we'll go ahead to logic and computing. And then finally, we'll go to culture and computing. And of course, the conclusion, references, etc. for friends. Historical perspective, what is the difference between history and historical perspective? I'll just explain it now. Oh, sorry. Historical perspective refers to a subject in the phases and subsequent alone. The perspective differs from history because its object is to sharpen one's vision of the present, not the past. History considers in respect of the past only where the historical perspective is for the purpose of the present, to improve the present. 
using written documents and artifacts to study public health management during 1980 to 20 influenza Spanish flu pandemic and during earlier pandemics is historical research. Whereas using historical information about the pandemic to explain differences in public health management today is historical perspective. Friends, what are the advantages of historical perspective? Historical perspective, especially in matters relating to the society, including technology, is highly desirable at its expands research horizons by encouraging study of relative stability of the phenomena, providing alternate explanations of the phenomena and aiding problem formulation and research design. So friends, you can see that from the current point of view, historical perspective is very important. And I have tried to develop this lecture from historical perspective. And the first, let us go into the concept, second clarification about the title. Computer science, Dicaster is one of the founding fathers of computer science. And there is actually misunderstanding that computer science is the science of computer. It is not at all. Computer science is no more about computer than astronomy is about telescopes. This is Edgar Weister. Computer or computer science is neither science of computer nor outcome of current computer revolution. The term computer science is a misnomer as it gives impression as if it is science of the computer. And this is why in Europe, they don't use the term computer science, they use the term informatics. Various terms, computing, computer science, computation, informatics, information processing, are quite closely related to each other, but are distinct. Also, the discipline is not of recent origin, as we'll explain in this talk. It has been practiced since ancient times in various cultures. Friends, first of all, brief outlook on look at the computing. The term computing includes study and experimentation of algorithmic processes and development of both hardware and software, computing as scientific, engineering, mathematical, technological, and social aspect. The term computing is also synonymous with counting and calculating. Major computing disciplines include computer engineering, computer science, cybersecurity, data science, etc. Thus, the term computing is more generic. Its subject better subsumes or overlaps those of almost other types. Now, friends, we'll start with the antiquity. <coughs> As I mentioned, that computing, rudimentary computing, started about one million back years back when human beings started speaking. So, in this respect. We listen to this great man. He is C.R. Rao. He is one of the most respected statistician ever born. He has celebrated his 102nd birth, 103rd birthday on September 10th. Here, by, uh, in, in addition to paying our regards to him, I am remembering him because of his comments about statistics, which is given in yellow. Statistics has a long antiquity, but a short history. Its origin could be traced back to the beginning of mankind, but only in recent time it has been studied as a subject of great importance. This is given on page 125 of the book, Statistics and Truth, Putting Chance to Work. I'll advise all my young friends to read this book. If they need the soft copy of this, I can send it. This is a really highly readable book. But in our case, now, what is its relation to computing? By paraphrasing and slightly modifying what C.R. Rao has said about statistics, we can say about computing. Friends, computing has a long antiquity, but a short history. Its origin could be traced back to the beginning of mankind, but only in recent times it has emerged as a subject of great practical importance. The rest of the discussion is a sort of justification of the above statement. Friends, in summary, in advance, I tell you that computing involves alphabetization, which is ancient human mental activity. 
Computing involves symbolization. Most ancient, most ancient human mental activity. Computing is an algorithmic activity. Ancient human computing is a formal activity, mostly of the recent origin. This is of recent origin. Computing is a logical activity, again practiced since ancient times. Friends, now we'll come to spoken. Please note the word alphabetic. The most important word in the next four or five slides is alphabetic. Spoken, alphabetic capability is the beginning of the human advantage over other primates and animals. Between 50,000 to 2 billion ago, when human beings started distinguishing from other primates like monkeys and apes, it was alphabetization, capability to create sequences of phoneme as unit of sound. Please consider the word buffalo. Now, when I speak bu, then I speak fu. No meaning emerges in my mind. But when I say buffalo, then all of a sudden a black animal emerges in my mind. Similarly, when we speak elephant, a, le, but no meaning emerges. But when we speak a, le, fent, similarly about the man, well, all these words, when the last phoneme, each of the word is divided in three phonemes. When the last but all other phonemes are spoken, we do no meaning emerges in our minds. But when the last one all together are spoken, some meaning emerges. That is the importance of alphabetization. That is the reason how, why human beings have advantages over the other animals, because all other animals have a continuum, no break, no phonemes are there, no alphabetization is there in their speech. They gibber, screech, roar, etc. But those are continuum, not broken up, or they are not alphabetized. However, human utterances can be broken into speech, into phonemes, uniformly recognizable sounds, which in turn form the basis of representing complex thoughts. I'll explain further. Friends, before going into more details, first of all, I'll tell writing of pictography through the writing of pictography and then alphabetic writing. I'll explain the human advantage. Now there are evidences of writing about 450,000 very rudimentary type of that. And engraving of bones are available from 50,000 to 12,000 years ago. Now these are first pictorial signs. Please understand. Please note the word pictographic. These are not alphabetic. These have been there from around 9,000 created by different generations of people. But now, we come to alphabet. Alphabetic writing started in Mesopotamia about 3100 BC, that is about almost 5500 years back in Mesopotamia in the beginning. And this is one of the tablets which is available. The second, almost second in development of civilization, Egypt is there. There from also alphabetic writing is available from the period about 2690 BC, In this respect, we have a map that the earliest civilizations developed somewhere here, Mesopotamia, which is the region covered by modern Iraq, Syria, and all that. And here is the Egypt. This is called Fertile Crescent also. So earliest civilizations have developed here. This is the map. Mesopotamia is the almost the earliest. Then Egypt is there. And then Indus civilization, Hunga and other valleys are there. Why I'm showing here? That the writing also, alphabetic writing also started in these regions first. And that may be the reason either because the development was so much that they started writing or because they started writing and they alphabetically Therefore, they became advanced. And this is the earlier development of writing in the history. 
uh, well, almost similar in a different form representation that at the top Mesopotamia is there and all that is. Now I come to you. What is so special about alphabetic? Friends, this is explained by the alphabetic sequence and mental image. We speak L or we write L. No mental image is made. Then we write L I. No mental image is made. Then I write L I O. No mental image. But once N is also added, all of a sudden the picture on the right emerges. And that is the advantage of the of alphabetization. That is just adding N to LIO, which is already available. Almost immediately a sign, a symbol emerges in our minds. And that is the beauty of alphabetization. Friends, in order to understand the significance of alphabetization, I have here, these are photographic, not alphabetic writings. We have iconic and indexical ones. They are six in number. Now you collect, pick up one, two, three in any order, all the six. If you select three, the information conveyed is just of those three only, not uh, nothing else. If you add the fourth, just additional information conveyed by the fourth is only the information contained in the fourth. And that is of the pictorial writing. That is icons or indexical signs which are pictorial. You choose as many the information conveyed is not anything additional. But friends, look at the last few lines of the slide. Now consider alphabetic. I emphasize alphabetic. <clears throat> we are having four words. One is spare, second is not, third is hang, and fourth is comma. But as I mentioned in the case of pictography, if you add any new symbol, only meaning added is only the, that of the new symbol. But here, just by changing the R, it becomes a question of life and death. First of all says that is comma is placed after the first. And in the second one, comma is placed after the two. First says spare, not hang. The second says spare, spare not hang. That is by the change of the place of comma changes completely the meaning, whereas that does not happen if you select the above pictographic, iconic and industrial signs. So that is the beauty, that is the significance of alphabetic writing. Alphabetic writing provides us with capability of maneuvering or presenting our thoughts in various ways. And now you friend, if you want to see the beauty of alphabetic writing, just adding something changes their meaning completely. You read these are written by very famous authors. My uncle's dying wish was to have me sit in his lap. And then you read by adding something more. My uncle's dying wish was to have me sit in his lap. He was in the electric chair. The meaning is completely changed. Just by addition of a sentence, which did not happen in the case of pictographic representations. Giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world. Mark Twain says, very famous author. And afterwards he adds, giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world. I know because I have done it thousands of times. Completely the meaning is changed. And Burton Russell, famous philosopher, he says, word does not determine who is right, only who is left. The last word, left, has uh, completely changed the sense in what way, in what sense the sentence has been made. Last, I sleep only four hours a day. And then you read it in addition, I sleep only four hours a day and at least 10 hours a day. Friends, you can see, that just by adding something, the meaning is completely changed, which does not happen in the case of pictographic writing. And that is the beauty of alphabetic representation. And this is why I have taken it up here. Alphabetization is powerful tool for an intelligence. 
to express, represent, create, and convey to others its ideas, intended meanings, imagination, and creativity. And therefore, alphabetization is very important activity which has played into the, the uh, development of later technological tools. We are fully justified in paraphrasing Professor C.R. Rao. Computing has a long antiquity, but short history, because alphabetization, fundamental activity in computing science in speech started between 50,000 to 2 billion years ago. Then human beings started distinguishing from other primates like monkeys and apes from the beginning of the mankind, because mankind started with the speech. It's further, on analysis, it found that it provides means for creating symbols. Uh, what do we mean by symbol? When you write L, no symbol. Then you write L, I, no symbol. L, I, O, no symbol. But once you add N, it becomes a symbol. It gives a picture in our mind. So means for creating symbols for not only to represent almost anything and everything from nature, any entity and any phenomenon, but also any concept of our idea or pure fig of imagination of human mind. How from the meaningless sequence L, L, I, L, I, O, all of a sudden this picture of line appears in our minds on post fixing of N. So you can see the beauty of, and the importance and significance of alphabetization. And the major advantage of alphabetization is because it gives rise to symbolic representation, which is the soul of computing. Computing sciences also include symbolization. Also, speech is purely a symbolized activity, and symbolization is more fundamental. Please understand it. We can utter words, we can speak words only when we have some symbols in our minds. Symbols are conveyed through speech. So symbolization is an activity which is more primitive than the speech. So symbolization, which is basis of the computing, is also the basis of human civilization. Inherited characteristic, which is the next topic, as I mentioned already, that computing has four parents mathematics from which it inherits abstraction, generalization, symbolic manipulation, logical reasoning, precision, construction, etc. Linguistic, the programming language design principles, logic to derive convincingly or mostly irrefutable implicit facts in given data. In the data, there is something hidden which is very useful, which is very important. However, it is logic which extracts it. It is used particularly in knowledge discovery, etc., but in, otherwise in every branch of computer science and electronics. Hence, one of the plausible views, as I mentioned earlier, apart from computing engineering part, computing is equal to executable mathematics plus efficiency consideration. From this point of view, computing may be considered as that special part of mathematics, which can be expressed in such a way that it can be understood and executed efficiently by non-human intelligence. Also, as I told in the previous lecture also, that computing is, computers are different type of intelligences. And for the key purpose of communication between the two, we have some formal languages. More specifically, mathematics has contributed to the development of computer science to the following development of algorithms, which has been a tradition in mathematics for at least thousands of years. Then the philosophy of mathematics. Philosophy of mathematics arises from the formalization of mathematics and theory of computations. Theory of computations tells us mathematically that what is possible and what is not possible. Many of the things are not possible through the computers and design and development of mathematical model. Mathematics contributes to computing through these various forms, algorithms, formalization of mathematics, theory of computation, and mathematical model. So first of all, we discuss algorithms and their development. Algorithms are possibly the most ancient conscious computing activity. And just now I said, Alphabetization or speech 
and symbolizations are very primitive. But they are unconscious activities. They have been either having the brain functions or they are deeply ingrained our, in our subconscious. However, algorithms have been developed through conscious efforts of human beings. So they are the most ancient conscience, conscious computing activity. Friends, we will ask, what is the basic methodology of computer science or computing? We have physics and many sciences use methods which are experimental, theoretical, and now simulation-based and data science-based. In mathematics, many of the methods are symbolic representation and transformation to obtain new representation, which are either equivalent or logically derived ones. So what is the method of computer science? Hence, it is algorithmic. Step-by-step -step method of solving problems using elementary operations like read, write, etc., and use of tools again based on algorithm. So if somebody asks us what is the methodology of computer, so algorithm, but algorithm has been practiced at least in mathematics for thousands of years. Therefore, computing has ancient roots through algorithm. An algorithm roughly can be defined as the description or statement of finite sequence of activities leading to at least one out that is very that constitute a process executes by machine. Algorithm may be considered as a proposed solution expressed in a language or semi-formal language prepared by human being for the purpose of getting executed. And the notion or concept of algorithm were known to ancient civilizations of India, Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, Greece, in some cases since at least 2500 BC, probably for the first time in Mesopotamia. The earliest evidence of algorithm is found in Babylonian mathematics of ancient Mesopotamia, the region which is in Iraq. The division algorithm was known since at least 2500 BC. Algorithms arithmetic are also found in Egyptian mathematics dating back to 1515 BC. Again, algorithmic solution as computing activity has ancient roots. In India, algorithm described in the form of Shulba Sutra. Shulba is uh, a sort of, uh, you can say, thread or ray, uh, see in Hindi, which is now at least well, at least 1000 year BC. Bodhiyana Shulba Sutra of the so-called Pythagoras term was known much before Pythagoras, around 8th century BC, for calculating the length of a diagonal of a right angle triangle. In Sanskrit, it says, Jirg Chatur Srisha Raju Parshava Mani Tirme, Mani Burvate Kaloti. A rope stretched along the length of a diagonal produced an area with the vertical and horizontal sides meet together. So, friends, algorithms have been practiced in India at least since 1000 BC, that is about almost, you can say, 3000 years. Now, classical period, other contributions of Indians. The algorithmic tradition include classical period from 400 to 1200 CE of mathematics in medieval India. Well-known names are Arya Bhatta, Varamihir, Brahmagupta, Bhaskara, Bhaskara II, and many other. The finest mathematicians of that period in the world. They were the finest of their time. Nobody matched them. Then the, there is another very significant period of development of algorithms or mathematics, and that was Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics, which published between 14 to 16. And some of the prominent contributors of that period included Neil Kanta, Somayaji, who is the founder of this period, Parameshwara, and all that. Friends, other notable contributions regarding computing include first known use of zero by mathematician in ancient India around 500. The use of zero was known to the Indian over 500 BC. Of course, the use of zero in the decimal system 
came into vogue around 500 CE afterwards, after, after 1000 years. But the use was not in 500 BCE. Use of the idea of binary number, binary number which is the foundation of computing, by Ping Lain, Chanda Sastra treatise was in around 300 BC. Jaina mathematicians inventions of algorithm happened in 280. And Pram Gupta's description of the modern place value number systems happened around 680. And floating point number systems of Kerala school around 40. All these, whether it is zero, whether it is binary number, whether it is logarithmic, or whether it is place value system, or whether it is floating point, each plays very significant role in the modern computing. Hence, however, the term algorithm was quite late in honor of the great mathematician Al Khwarizmi of Baghdad. Al Khwarizmi, through his book entitled On the Calculation with Hindu Numerals, written about 820, spread the Hindu Arabic numeral system in the Middle East and then to the Yak. Now, I'll tell a little bit, though, of course. Professor Horda and other friends have already mentioned about the power of algorithm. However, advanced an application of computer is based only on a system of algorithms. For example, an autonomous vehicle moves on a road safely without a driver just by using a complex system of. So this is the power of algorithm. We are discussing algorithm from ancient time to the modern and we mentioned the power of algorithm. Now, some clarification. After looking at the power of algorithm, particularly automated drive, we think that everything can be done with through the algorithm. No, it is a misconception. Any, first of all, we know, any solution of a problem using computer is a solution by a system of algorithm. In view of the visible power of computer, thinking computer can solve any problem is wrong. You will be surprised before no com stored program computer was available, not even that. Who, almost whole of the theory of computer science was developed during 1930s. That is theory preceded practice. This is a rare example of an academic discipline. And most of the other cannot be solved by computer without the help by some system of algorithm, step by step. Most of others, that is only a very small fraction of the problems which we human beings encounter can be solved with the help of computers, but most of the others can be solved only by intervention of human beings. Friends, I discuss here a very elementary problem which may be solved easily by the human beings, but even the most powerful computer cannot solve this problem. Let us have a look for one. This is a problem, please read it. <clears throat> a bear, starting from point P, walked one while towards south. Then he changed direction and walked, walked one mile east. Then he turned again and one, walked one mile north and arrived exactly where he started. Question, what is the color of the bear? Hence, Every problem is, is solved through computational means. The data should be sufficient in order to solve the problem. But in whatever is given, nowhere the, beer, the color is mentioned. How can we solve this problem where the data does not give any inkling of the color? The problem graphically says the beer starts at P, goes down one mile, then goes east, and then it goes north. And you can see it does not reach the same point. It is apparent paradox. And even if suppose it reaches how it is related to the color of the beer, friends, it is a human intention, intuition. The problem is given in one of the most famous books of <clears throat> air you can have. That if you are at the North Pole, then first going south, 
then going east and then going north. Only at the North Pole, you can achieve this type of motion. And therefore you are talking of the beer at North Pole where the beers are white. Therefore the answer is white, but not, it can't be solved by computer systems. It requires human intervention to solve the problem. What I wanted to emphasize to this problem is that there is a very large set of problems which cannot be solved by computers by themselves. They need human intervention. Next, we come to the second contribution of mathematics to computing. We take paradoxes and computing. Friends, these are newspaper reports. Chirapunji is known for the paradox of suffering severe and persistent water shortage. Despite being the wettest place in the world, this is news of Hindu of 2013. Had I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. If you get more time, you write a larger letter. This is our intuition. But here, it is a contradiction. Why? The paradox is that fishermen would catch more fish if they fished less. The paradox is that fishermen would catch more fish if they fished less. All these three statements are paradoxical. What does a paradox mean? There is something wrong somewhere. Two conflicting statements are occurring simultaneously. Now, if we analyze a bit further, we find out the reason. And that is the way the paradoxes are resolved. Chirapongi paradox says, may be true due to difficulty or neglect in the stories of read water for later use. This all slips down. Pascal's paradox, after careful thought, would be summarized. Because if you write a very long letter, to make a good summary requires a lot of time. That is the same amount of information, rather more better information can be conveyed in lesser words, but that requires more time. And fisherman paradox is by fishing less will allow the fish to breed and breeding leads to more fish. So what I mean to say, paradoxes are apparent fallacies which need further investigation in order to be resolved. And these have been practiced since almost ancient times. So a definition of paradox is a situation that seems strange because it involves two conflicting statements. A statement that seems impossible because it contains two opposing ideas that are both true. A statement which though true seems false and self contradictory So these are some of the definitions. Uh, now we'll go to some of the very well-known paradoxes in history. And friends, these paradoxes, the resolution of these have contributed a lot to the development of mathematics and computing. The first most well-known paradox is that of Jeno. Jeno, among the earliest recorded instances of paradoxes are Jeno's paradox, which are a set of philosophical problems generally thought to have been devised by Greek philosophers. And this is there. there the Achilles was the fastest runner of Athens. He was made to run with a tortoise. And because the tortoise moved slowly, therefore he, he was, the tortoise was given an advantage. So, now Geno argues like this, that Achilles will never be able to catch the tortoise by the following reasons, but because actually Achilles overcomes, therefore there is a paradox. So initially the tortoise have advantage of say 100 meters. Now, when the general's argument is that when Achilles reaches the previous position of tortoise, in the meantime, tortoise goes ahead. And then when the Achilles goes to the new position, tortoise goes ahead. So every time Achilles reaches the previous position of tortoise, tortoise covers some distance 
and in this way it should logically logically not physically should not be able to come to overcome the thought ties now this is a paradox logical paradox that the reasoning is very sound however as in the case of chirapunji if you go deeper then we find out that there is a fallacy here the fallacy there are various fallacies in this one one of these is that we are taking <coughs> the position <coughs> we, we are taking the time as independent variable and the distance as dependent variable if we take the other way then we can say that in this time how much a kill will cover how much thought wise will cover and in that case we will be able to resolve the problem so what i mean to say the paradoxes involve something deeper which require further investigation and here it was found that the independent variable should be taken different from the earlier ones now this is very important it plays a very important role in computer science it is called barber's paradox it is proposed by russell who is one of the father of modern logic and computer science also in a small village there is only one barber the barber shaves all and only those adults who do not shave themselves now question is does barber shave himself or not because if barber shaves himself then he is not shaved by the barber and vice versa so this is again a logical fallacy what are we mean to say this is an apparent paradox and this paradox actually applied it goes more generalized that if x is the collection of all those sets that don't belong to themselves then the question is does x belongs to x because x consists of only those sets which don't belong to themselves so if x belongs to itself it does not belong to x and vice versa these actually this shook this is not a simple paradox friends they shook the foundations of mathematics particularly logic school they thought that they thought that mathematics can be expressed at set theory plus logic but this paradox shook the followers of this philosophy and they found and our russell came as a big shock to them hence what is the contribution of the resolution of the paradox plays a very important role in the design of programming languages russell actually developed type theory which is a must for design of every programming language so what i mean to say paradoxes have played a very important role since antiquity in development of mathematics and also of computing about impos this is a very good book readable book you must read it if you, you get the impossibility it is by johann de baro he says paradoxes play a very significant role in the intellectual history of an overshading revolutionary development whenever in any discipline a problem that cannot be solved within the conceptual framework we experience shock the shock may compel us to discard the old framework and adopt a new one and that is the reason many new theories have been developed here we give some of the instances for example zeno's paradox developed convergent in finite series in mathematics antinomies led to gödel's theory i hope you must be knowing gödel's was one of the most well known philosopher of previous century who demolished the helbert's program of mathematics based on logic a paradoxical result of Ma michael's and morley experiment on the speed of light set the stage for the theory of relativity the discovery of wave particle duality of light force a reexamination of the deterministic causality the very foundation of scientific philosophy and the quantum theory the paradox of maxwell demon gave impetus to the profound insight that seemingly this concept of information entropy are intimately related so friends you can see that paradox is not only in mathematics 
they have played role in physics and other academic disciplines also. Now, third, I come to the linguistics. Linguistics has been practiced in India since at least 2500 BC. And whatever the contribution to linguistics of Indians have been there, it is respect today also. And Panini is the father of modern linguistics, despite the fact he was born 2500 years back. But modern linguistics is completely based on his ideas. He has given a number of new computational concepts also while writing the Ashta Adhyay, the grammar of Sanskrit, about 2500 years back. The two concepts of modern mathematics, one is meta-language and the other recursion, which are foundations of computer science in design of programming languages and in expressing the solutions of the problem. Recursion and meta language were developed, were conceived by Panini 2500 years back. These are tools for expressing potentially infinite processes using finite resources. And what is recursion? As you'll see just now, just in two or three lines, you can write the solution of a factorial of one million. That is just two or three lines. Therefore, Recursion allows us to express potentially infinite process in a small amount of lines. These two concepts constitute soul of computer science. Now, just briefly, the solution of finding out the factorial of one million, you need to give to the just two line program. And that is the beauty of recursion. That is the solution of n factorial is written in terms of the solution of n minus one factorial. And so every stage, the problem is reduced by one. And in this way, though the solution is very large, its process may take long time, but the, for the programmer, programmer need to write, and this is the beauty of recursion. Friends, this problem I have discussed earlier also, these are called snowflake and fractal is a very important branch of mathematics and even computing. And they, those are also based on the concept of recursion. The significance, another one was meta language, but because of shortage of time, I'm not going into the details of this. Meta language was also proposed by Panini about 2,500 years back. And you can see the importance of meta language proposed by Panini that each and every programming language without exception has to be defined using a meta language. And therefore, friends, linguistics, which form the basis of modern computing, is again rooted at least 2700 years back. Next concept is formal. What and why? From the beginning of practice of mathematics, some intellectuals felt uneasy that mathematics is not based on sound foundation. Earliest examples were Euclidean geometries. Similarly, around 1900s, mathematicians felt that the mathematics is not on sound foundation. I give one example. Newton used the concept of continuity. Given epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta, so and so on. Epsilon greater than zero, as small as we like, is the assumption of Newton's and Leibniz's calculus for continuity. But friends, we know epsilon greater than zero, epsilon by two is less than epsilon, but again positive. And therefore, there is a contradiction. There were many problems in the foundations of mathematics, which I can't discuss now. So they found. The pioneers try to find out how to make mathematics on sound foundations. So one of the solutions was found that instead of writing P-L-U-S, you make a cross. Instead of writing M-I-N-U-S, you just make this one. Instead of writing square root, you just use this, this symbol. There exists and uh, that was one of the approach which is called formalism. The purpose of formalization is to facilitate 
unambiguous understanding of the various actors' communication through this one. And friends, you know, every computer program is a formal system. Computer understands and executes only formal things. It does not understand informal communication. All programming languages are formal. So this is the, for every programming language, it has to be a formal language in which the syntax and semantics have to be explained in fine detail. You have to tell only these letters are acceptable as the letters of the alphabet, etc. So that is formalism. Formalism and computing revolution. All programming languages are formal languages and all software machine developed so far are based only on formal language. Thus the realization of the potential of computing has been only possible because of the formalization movement. What I want to tell that though computing has its origin about 1 million back, but the tool, the computer, which works at electronic speed is possible only after the realization of formalization movement. Friends, there is another branch. We talked of formal, there is another very important discipline, logic, also plays a very important role in computer. So, logicism school founded in 1884 by German mathematician Gottlieb Frege was later strengthened by Burton Russell and Pianos. I'm talking of history because this is a lecture on history. The purpose of logicism was to show that classical mathematics, however, unlike formalism, the basis of logical approach is quite ancient in logic. Logic had been a branch of philosophy since ancient times. So briefly, we'll look at the history of logic in India and other and Greece particularly. The purpose of logic is to explicate the implicit knowledge. A number of facts are there, but there is a fact which is hidden in it, which can be very useful. Now to explicate that implicit is the role of logic. And it is very important in knowledge discovery and of course in other aspects of computer science. What is logic? It is an academic discipline concerned with reasoning. It not only describes how we should investigate, but prescribe how we should reason. An example of how we should reason is there. That if we say if all A's are B's and all B's are C's, then all A's are C's concluding is correct. However, if somebody says if some A's are B's, and some B's are C's, and then concluding that some A's are C's are wrong. In the figure at the bottom, you can see there are number of A's which are B's also. There are number of B's which are C's also, but there is no A which is C. That is, this, the second one is incorrect form of reasoning. Now, logic tells us you should use the first one, but not the second. This type of what are the correct forms of reasoning is the job of logic. We give another example here. A valid argument or correct argument, if you overslept, you will be late. You overslept, therefore you will be late. This is fine, because if you oversleep, then you will be late. Now, invalid, if you overslept, you will be late. You are late. Therefore, you overslept. So you may be late because of other reasons, despite having not overslept. So this is an invalid reason. The job of logic is to point out which are valid arguments and which are invalid arguments. So it has been practiced in all civilizations, ancient civilization from ancient times. I'll take just Indian logic. You can say it in Eastern logic, because in first century, with Buddhism, Indian logic went to China and from there it spread to Korea, Japan, and all other. So you can call it Eastern logic also. Earliest visit, evidence of logical thinking in India is available in Nastya Sukta of Rig, Rig Veda. 
which was composed about 2000 BC into 1400 BC. The Indian tradition of logic and scientific methodology, where main concerns were epistemic knowledge, dates back to at least as early as 650 BC and is based on the following. Metatiti Gautamas, Anvishka, Paninis, Astavadhyay, Kannad's Visheshika school, and Gautamas Nyaya school of Hindu philosophy, all before second century BC. So that is the root of Indian logic. Now, Eastern logic, apart from the Hindu or Vedic logic, there were other schools like Jain and Buddhist. Their philosophy was different from the Vedic school, and they also contributed a lot, particularly Buddhists contributed from 500 C to 1300 C, and the Jains contributed from 6th century BC to the 17th century. And Buddhist logic uh, includes doctrine, etc. Now, friends, we briefly come to the history of the Western logic also. The Western logic began with the Greeks in the classical period of 5th and 4th century with different traditions. One is the paradox, which I have discussed by Eleatic school, which was started around 500 BC. And the second was syllogism by Aristotle. In the modern period, some of the prominent Western logicians include Leibniz, Gottfried, Hegel, Burton, Russell, North Heidel, Russell's student, Ludwig, Kurt Kuerl is really very important. From, apart from these logicians, there is a very large number of others who have made fundamental contributions, including Babbage, Lovelace, Wiener, Turing, and Shen. Only a few. A very large group, hundreds of people from the West have contributed to the modern computing revolution. Now I'll give example of syllogism of Aristotle. It is of the form all A's are B's and all C's are A. So all, it is a form. Anyway, no A's or B's, just for the sake of completeness, I have given some examples of syllogism. Friends, last. Culture and computing. As I mentioned in the very beginning, that historical perspective means that you look how the technology has been affecting humanity and vice versa, how the social and cultural environment leads to the development of technology. So we will have a brief look. Culture is that part of social intelligence which guides and directs tacitly and intuitively our actions, mundane, intellectual and spiritual, which evolves unconsciously. That main thing of culture is that we go to the temple or we go to something, we practice something without knowing that we are doing it because of the cultural impact. Here we briefly discuss how culture and computing have been impacting each other for the previous thousands of years. Friends, the best example of cultural impact is that Bruno, who lived in the 16th century, that is up to 1600. He said that earth is not the center of the universe. And for saying so, he was burnt alive in 1600. But in 1670 or so, the greatest computer scientist so far recognized Newton was celebrated for doing the same thing. Why? Because during the 70 years from 1600 to 1670, there was a cultural revolution which has taken place in Europe because of the leading philosophers, René Descartes, Francis Bacon, and all others. And they have changed the conception or the culture of the Europe. And once again, I repeat, Bruno, because of the culture of that time, was burnt alive for saying the same thing in 1600, where Newton was celebrated 70 years afterwards because the culture has changed. So friends, you can understand the role of culture in technological development or scientific progress. Now, Western culture based on Abrahamic religion 
Now, this is a very important thing. They think that anything, it is epistemological or uh, uh, met metaphysical question, what exists, it is a very important question in philosophy. So, Western culture was, you cannot accept something existing if you cannot experience. Because we can, we can see or experience one horse, two horse, three horse, but we can't experience zero. So, zero was accepted in the Western culture with very difficulty. It was accepted only around the 12th or 13th century. Westerns had difficulty in conceiving zero, infinity, negative numbers also you can't experience. And therefore, they were, these were accepted with a lot of difficulty in Western culture. But powerful imagination embedded deeply in Eastern culture. There was no difficulty in accepting the purely imaginary based concepts like neg negative number zero and infinity. And therefore, infinity and zero were conceived in Vedic period about 3000 years back by Eastern culture, where the Westerns had difficulty even in 11th and 12th century. And this is a mantra which says, <coughs> Om Purnamidaya, Purnamidam Purnamadaya, Purnasya Purnamadaya, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. What is the meaning of this? The second line, taking fullness from fullness, fullness indeed remains, that take infinite for infinity, then again infinity is remaining, and that is actually the modern definition of infinity. What I want to convey you is that the culture makes a lot of difference to the scientific development and technological development in the East, zero and infinity were easily acceptable because they worked of the imagination based. However, the Western did not. They accepted only those things existing which they could feel with senses. And this cultural difference made a lot of difference to the same. Again, you can see even Indian rock, these are examples of infinity. The boundaries are and are not complete. This shows that it goes up to infinity. This was about 10,000 years in Indian Peninsula. That is, we had the idea of the sense of infinity about 10,000 years back. Now, I give a simple example of how zero has played a very important role in the development of computing. Friends, on the left hand, you have the numbers written in Roman which were used in Europe even up to 13th or 14th century. And you come to the left, right hand side. If you try to find out the product of these using purely Roman numerals, it may take two or three days or you may not be successful at all. But on the right, if you use decimal numbers, it is child's play. Friends, I may tell, that up to 14th and 15th century, people in Europe used to feel difficulty in problems of multiplication. And they used to go to a specialized place near Paris, which is called Sorbonne, to get their multiplication problems solved. What I mean to say is that the zero facilitated decimal representation and zero was conceived very easily by the Easterners. Where, and this made a lot of difference to the solving of problems and representation of problems. Now we, like, how, uh, we, I explain how the culture impacted computing. Now I tell the other way, how computing is impacting the culture. Now you know generation Y or 2000, they are different from our generation who were born between 1980 to 2000. They are multitaskers, more connected, tech savvy, curious, instant gratification, work-life balance, diversity in business and enterprise. This is a culture which is different from the culture of the people born before 1980. Now, this is a part of the culture. That is, you are standing side by side. But you are not talking to each other at all. But you are happy otherwise. On the right hand, people are on a dinner party. But they are busy with this, this is a part of the culture. 
friends, this is also a part of the culture that the person is alone but not lonely. And here on the right, you see one of the persons makes a promise. I'll go a whole month without using my cell phone. So these are the impacts of the culture. Friends, this is not the funny side of the culture. The current culture of the new generation has many, many, much more significant positive contributions. Nowadays, a number of countries and number of groups of intellectuals collaborate together. Here I'm giving just two examples of collaboration of intellectuals from all over the world. One is International Space Station Program and the next is Human Genome Project. And these are two very successful projects because of the culture of cooperation generated by communication revolution. So that is the impact of culture on the modern friends. Not only that, you see some of the modern things. Wikipedia, at the click of a button, you get the desired knowledge. These have been done by these two great people, Jimmy Wills and John. Free of cost, you get immense amount of knowledge of the desired amount. On the right, Sir Turner's Lee, father of World Wide Web, his one condition <coughs> for contributing to this, that the web should be available to the, everybody free of cost. And here, some of the philanthropists who are making a lot of contribution to the poor. You may be knowing Azim Premji is contributing 70,000 rupees per day for the welfare of the Indian people and other people. What I want to say, this computer revolution has generated a new culture of cooperation and philanthropy also. And this is my conclusion. We discussed that computing activity is one of the most sentient and at the same time, most recent of human intellectual. Also its pursuit involves from the most fundamental questions from philosophy and psychology to social sciences and cultural issues to mathematics, science and engineering. It was emphasized that fundamental issues also need attention, especially in view of the what French polymath Henry Pinker said, please read it very carefully. One has only to open one's eyes to see that trumps of industry, which have enriched so many practical men like Zuckerberg and Peter <clears throat> and Bill Gates would never have seen the light if only these practical men had existed. And if they had not been preceded by some disinterested fools like Tim Berners-Lee, who died poor, who never thought of the useful and yet had a guy that was not their own caprice. This was written by Henry Poincare in 1908. What is the summary of this statement is, that fundamentals also need to be discussed, to be emphasized, to be re-examined and all that. Of course, technology is very important. The brilliant contributions, brilliant gadgets which are happening every day, but they are happening because some fundamental contributions have been there. Of course, Zuckerberg and Bill Gates are really respectable. But had there not been a Tim Berners-Lee who has developed a worldwide web, they could not have become rich also. That is the message of this lecture. It's, well, uh, the slides are not moving. Uh, yeah, these are some of the research generals uh, for the purpose. Uh, these are some of the references. And finally, thank you very much. And any questions, please? Thank you, sir. Thank you for the enlightening deliberation. I'm sure this insightful session has enlightened the participants about the 
uh, statistics of this uh, historical perspective of computer sciences as there are a number of questions from the participants which i will now like to take up with your permission sir yes yes sir so first question we have computer sciences have a solid mathematical background then why till date a self aware agents like human beings is still a dream uh, i could understood stand the part mathematics provides solid background to computing but second part please speak again yes sir why till date a self aware agent like a human being is still a dream uh, still uh, a dream. Last word is not clear. Uh, sir, dream. D R E A M. Dream. Sapna kyun hai? Uh, uh, you can uh, spell it out once again, please. Last word. Yes, sir. D R E A M. E R. D R E A M. D for Delhi. E. Uh, can Sir, you... actually, uh, they want to know that why till date we have been unable to make a self-aware machine just like human beings. No, please listen. This is not a question of pure mathematics. It is technological issue also. Of course, mathematics, as I mentioned, have been very strong, particularly in Greece from 4th to 6th century BC. And in the middle period, please, this is very important question. In the middle period after say third century BC to almost 14th century AD, hardly there was any fundamental progress in thinking. Whatever the Greeks gave that was done by Arabs and others who maintained that only but as according to the Western philosophers, scholars, they did not contribute anything fundamental. Please, I want to make clear. But the technological improvement and progress during the Muslim, Muslim golden period has no parallel in history. Even earlier in the Egypt, when pyramids were made, the mathematics was not that developed. What I mean to say, mathematics pro provides very sound background, but technology is a different thing. How we use mathematics to create technology is a different issue. Mathematics develops in its own way. What is mathematics? Mathematics is a self-consistent system. It provides power to our brain, but it is hardly technological, how you apply it. How Aristotle could not become Zuckerberg? He was a pauper. Even I don't know whether you know it or not, Socrates died poor, though he is the father of mathematics and philosophy in the West. What I mean to say, definitely, what, what is the purpose of mathematics in technology is that if you can prove your technology sound with the help of mathematics, it will definitely work. What I mean to say, when Turing, Post and others and Gödel etc. proved in 1930s that mathematics, the computer cannot solve more than a very small fraction of the problems which we human encounter. It will be always true because it is proved mathematically. If you have not proved it mathematically, you claim something, tomorrow it may be false. So we have to differentiate between the two lines that how you use mathematics to develop technology is another issue. Developing mathematics is another issue. So there has to be a sort of marriage between the mathematician and the technologician to develop more reliable technology. So that is the answer to the question. But Absolutely. The question. Absolutely, sir. Very well explained. Thank you so much. 
uh, I would also like to ask another question, sir. That yes. Are simplifications in computing uh, only uh, attributed to artificial intelligence? Well, again, I'll have to think a bit. First of all, what is artificial intelligence? We'll have to go a bit details. Artificial intelligence, according to one of the uh, uh, authors, uh, the book is there with me, uh, Alain Veach. Artificial intelligence is an attempt to embed those skills in which at the time human beings are better than machine. So what I mean to say, as in my previous lecture also I mentioned, that the computing or computers, which is silicon intelligence, and human beings, which are bio-intelligence, they have different foundations, and therefore they lead in different ways. So what is the purpose of artificial intelligence is that whatever we have already achieved in which the machine is better than human beings, leave it. No, but still human beings are better. Now, how to incorporate those skills of the human beings in which they are better than us? But because they have different foundation, bio foundation, finding that itself is a problem for a silicon intelligence. So what I mean to say, that is just an approach, nothing else which tries to find out that whatever human beings are better than machine, they should be. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this wonderful session. Uh, the ease with which you have explained all these historical perspective has been wonderful. I would now request uh, Huda, sir, to kindly uh, uh, present a certificate and e-memento to Manohar, sir, for this wonderful session today. Thank you so much, Professor Manohar Lalji. It has been it has been sheer pleasure listening to you. Probably the way in which I kept reading reading your earlier books, which you have written for various programs of Igni. A technical topic, the way you deliver, it becomes a kind of novel which people keep on reading it.